people who are very surprised that priests remain who insist on saying the traditional Latin Mass exclusively and who resist the changes which emanated from the Second Vatican Council. Their objections might go somewhat as follows. The Holy Spirit was present at the Council. None of the changes were substantial, i.e. nothing essential has been changed, and one must submit in a period of obedience to the authorities who have instituted and initiated the reforms. Has nothing essentially essential changed? Or has an entirely new religion been introduced with its own set of dogmas, morals, and worship? I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today are two priests, exactly two such priests, who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively and who remain faithful to the traditions of the Church. Father Clarence Kelly is superior of the Society of St. Pius V. Also, he is the spiritual director of the Daughters of Mary, a congregation of traditional Roman Catholic sisters in Round Top, New York. Also with me is Father William Jenkins, editor, publisher of The Roman Catholic, and pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio. Reverend Fathers, perhaps we can leap right into the fire. There was an article which appeared in the Catholic Universe Bulletin some time ago of Cleveland, Ohio, diocesan newspaper, which is ultimately published by the bishop under his authority. He reviews everything that's in there, or at least is supposed to. And it had an article about a pastor of St. Anthony of Padua Church in uh, Parma, Ohio. And uh, among his accomplishments are he teaches Taekwondo to his parishioners, but more, more substantially, he is a author of a book called Shaping a Healthy Religion, Especially if You're Catholic. It was written on the island of Maui in Hawaii in 1982, and this is very significant. It won the St. Thomas More Medal for, quote, distinguished contribution to Catholic literature nonfiction written by a previously unpublished author. Uh, among the things that uh, the priest does, according to this article, which is in the diocesan newspaper, quote, for starters, he abandons hell, the devil, and purgatory. He argues that biblical tales, such as Adam and Eve in the garden and Noah in the ark, are, quote, just stories, unquote, and profoundly destructive ones at that. He deplores the guilt he claims Catholicism has fostered over the past 2,000 years, adding that the church's overconcern with sexual sins has caused untold uh, suffering. Then he says, it is as appropriate to speak of God the Father as God the Mother. He suggests that the church's failure to deal well with sex is perhaps to be expected when you have an all-celibate male leadership and says, if, quote, if we go to Mass because the church says we'll go to hell if we miss, then we remain moral adolescents. And let me just quote a little bit from the book, some of the things he says. This book is called Shaping a Healthy Religion, especially if you are Catholic. It's published by the Thomas More Press of Chicago, Illinois. He says the following. Jesus used the concept of hell when he was with us, yet that doesn't in itself make it real. When Jesus took on our humanity, he took on our ignorance. With incarnation, Jesus accepted the extent of human knowledge available at that time. He didn't know the world was round. He didn't know about nuclear physics. He grew in his knowledge, limited by what was then known. This is tricky ground. Jesus was truly God and truly man. But just as he spoke Aramaic, so he spoke in the religious terminology of his time. If Jesus was reincarnated in our own country today, he would speak English and use our contemporary religious concepts. Jesus used the notion of hell as a place of punishment. I don't think he would continue to use such an image if he were born today. And he goes on to say here, I have yet to use the word hell in a sermon. I'm just not sure what to do with it. The word conveys much more than it should. Another interesting quote, I certainly believe in evil. I also believe it can be spoken of in a personal way, personal way. but I don't believe in the conceptualization of evil known as Satan. Evil may have its own existence in some way. Perhaps it's some kind of spiritual force growing from the evil we find in ourselves. Then one more quote. 
we must be especially careful with children if we bring up the idea of Satan to them who he doesn't believe in they will have a hard time understanding what he's supposed to symbolize children should not be exposed to the notion of Satan unless they are first taught that Satan is not real maybe it's time to attempt a new symbolization for the reality of evil Satan as symbol has outlived most of his usefulness the fact remains that this book is promoted by Catholic authorities this man is the pastor in good standing of a supposedly Catholic church in the Cleveland Diocese and he's treated well and spoken of well with actually no inhibitions by the author of this article in the official diocesan publication what's the difference <coughs> I hope he knows more about Taekwondo than he knows about the Catholic faith <coughs> I don't know if they understand what you mean by that father because I don't know uh, Julius if you pointed out the fact that he claims to be a Taekwondo expert he's a black belt maybe you can focus in on this if you could for a moment <laughs> And uh, this is how they introduce him in the uh, diocesan newspaper here. Um, I, I, too, hope that he knows more about Taekwondo than he knows about Catholic theology <laughs> because he's going to get hurt very badly if he doesn't. <laughs> but he may be the pastor of an allegedly Catholic church and a priest in good standing in this diocese, but that man is not a Catholic. He's an apostate and a heretic. And the bishop that put him in there shares in his apostasy and his heresy. And whoever put that bishop in shares in it as well. That bishop is in line to become the head of the National Council of Catholic <coughs> Bishops, Bishop Anthony Pilla, by 1995. And it just shows you what the state of the bishops in this country is. And the secret Catholics, because I'm sure there are a few secret Catholics among the bishops in America, closet Catholics, unless they come out of their closet and defend the Catholic faith and the Catholic religion, they're going to share in what this guy is going to get when he dies, if he doesn't repent. You know, the, the problem is, is this man is not the exception. He's the norm. He's, that's why no one's upset. This article was published in broad daylight, and, the, well, and no one That's where they put him on the front of a diocesan newspaper, because as far as they're concerned, that's what they'd like to be the norm. They hold him up as an example. And they say nothing essential has changed. He denies dogmas of the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm blatantly and everyone says this is fine and these are the same people who will come back and say you're disobedient nothing is essential has been changed we still believe in the same things mm -hmm. see what is the norm I, I wouldn't necessarily say that the norm would be that radical and that dramatic at least I don't know if that's the norm what is the norm is that in this new religion this new religion with its new doctrines its new moral standard its new form of worship what is the norm is that you have high church, middle church, and low church. You'll have in the high church section of this new religion someone like Cardinal O'Connor. And in the low church section you'll have someone like Bishop Weakland. And this uh, fellow would be in the low church section. But the thing to understand, the norm is that as in the Anglican church, there is a variety of belief. So in this new religion that came out of the Second Vatican Council, there is this div uh, divergence or this variety of belief, but they all get along. In other words, in, in the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in the United States, you'd have a conservative like Cardinal O'Connor, and you'd have someone like Bishop Weakland, you see. These are sort of two ends of this spectrum of uh, bishops in this new religion but the thing is they all belong to the same club they all belong to the same religion they're all joined in faith and in worship and this is proof that this new church is in fact essentially a new church and a new religion Reverend Fathers perhaps we can back up to what I originally had uh, wanted to start asking you about what do you do? What is the nature of your priestly work? You say the traditional Latin Mass exclusively. Obviously, you're not being welcomed with open our, uh, arms by bishops who promote and protect and mm -hmm. propagate these kind of ideas. I'm curious, it is precisely because of this kind of thing, that this is the kind of priest who fits now in the post-conciliar church, that we would never fit in because we still believe the Catholic faith and we still recognize and honor the papacy as an institution not of history but of Christ. And so we've had to uh, leave our, our homelands and go off uh, across the ocean to be ordained to the traditional Catholic priesthood to return here and to function as traditional Roman Catholic priests, meaning we simply uh, believe and profess 
everything that the church has wanted her priests to believe and profess from the very beginning. That's why we don't fit now in the modern way, because it's the one thing they will not tolerate, is the traditional Catholic concept of the priesthood, the sacraments, and anything holy. Uh, Father Kelly and I both travel extensively, bringing the Mass to groups of Catholics all over the country. And if we could bilocate or trilocate, at least I haven't mastered that yet. I don't know about Father Kelly. Sometimes I wonder. We could be doing three or four times the amount of work. The Catholic people are out there. They want the true Catholic faith, and they feel like they're, they're prisoners uh, being held captive by these, uh, well, these apostates who don't have the Catholic faith. But the moment they try to, they, the people, try to profess it, they get the wrath of authority down on their heads. Why do you celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively? Why don't you celebrate the new Mass? Because a new mass does, mass does not express the Roman Catholic faith, and it was never intended to. Particularly. And also because in its English uh, form, it is, uh, in my opinion, almost certainly invalid. It's, uh, it's sacrilegious and it's even blasphemous. Uh, just if you consider the, the words of consecration for the wine, the fact that they would be so bold as to change the words that Christ used in the institution of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, our Lord said, this is the cup of my blood which will be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. And by the use of that word many, he was talking about the elect. And what they have done is they have changed that word, the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, to for all, and have introduced an essentially different doctrine, an essentially different meaning. It is true that our Lord died for all men on the cross, but the Mass is not offered for all men. There is a distinction between the value of the Mass and the fruit of the Mass. The value of the Mass is infinite. The fruit is limited to those who, in fact, embrace the true faith and ultimately save their souls, because all men are not saved. In fact, most men are lost. This is the constant teaching of the fathers. It is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many go that way, but few enter by the narrow gate. You know, this is not just the opinion, by the way, of Father Kelly and myself and a handful of other priests. Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Bacci, when the first uh, new mass came out, they, they spoke against it. They actually wrote to Paul VI, condemning it, saying that it would force Catholics to make a terrible decision. It would give them a crisis of conscience. He said that the new mass would satisfy the most liberal of Protestants. Subsequent history has proven those words to be true. You're watching what Catholics believe. You know, Reverend Fathers, uh, periodically we get letters from our viewers asking, what should I do? I can't go to the traditional mass or I can only go uh, infrequently. In fact, uh, a woman wrote as fo follows, uh, if I may interpret her letter, she said she goes to the n new mass, but she tries to follow her old missile. What should she do? She says as follows, Dear Father Kelly, a few weeks ago you made mention of the fact that attending only the Latin mass is acceptable. I called the number specified at the end of the program and found that the only Latin mass listed for this area is in Massachusetts. You also indicated that unless a Latin mass is attended, we are not in fact hearing mass. I have done the only thing I could decide upon. I've always used my old missile. I have been criticized many times, but I seem able to endure it. I'm sure I am not alone in asking you to address this matter again, thus to clarify the doubts many of us have in the existing confusion. We all want to know whether to continue as we're doing or not attend any of the masses. Please advise us. Yes, it's uh, obviously a very touching letter because here you have a woman who believes in the Catholic faith, who wants the true Mass, who wants to do what our Lord wants her to do, and she faces this dilemma. She goes to a local parish and she finds, in effect, there a new religion. She may not term it that, but in effect it's a new religion because if it were not a new religion, she'd have no trouble as a Catholic uh, participating in their service there. But because it claims to be Catholic, because it claims to have the sanction of authority, there is a dilemma. And I think the answer is, while I certainly understand what she feels and the reason she feels it, nevertheless, uh, we have to uh, look upon this in an objective way. And objectively speaking, the new mass, as it is said in the parishes throughout this country, is a sacrilege. It is a sacrilege against the most sacred thing there is 
uh, and that is to say the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And if a person goes and participates uh, in a sacrilege, if they uh, formally and uh, actively participate in the sacrilege, they're doing something that's wrong. And that is the reason why they should not go. It, it is sort of the, like the dilemma in some way, in a certain sense it's even worse, the dilemma of the Catholics in Germany. When Martin Luther began to introduce his new mass, he began to change things, certain Catholics, when they introduced communion in the hand, there were Catholics in the pew who had qualms of conscience, distress of soul, not knowing what to do. And of course the thing to do is to come out of that place, come out of it because it is a place of corruption. It is the corruption of the faith, even though there are a goodly number of sincere people who don't know what to do because they don't have leadership. This is the greatest crisis in the history of the church because we are without prophets and we, with, we are without leaders for a time. And we just have to do the right thing and wait till our Lord intervenes and restores things in the church. Catholics had a similar choice back in England over 400 years ago. They were heavily fined for not going to the state churches to attend the, the Church of England ceremonies. But Catholics were willing to pay those fines. Those who were not, who went to the services, eventually became a Church of England. They, they lost the faith entirely. Uh, it is a scandal for them to be seen there, even. Especially if they, if they believe that the Blessed Sacrament is truly present there and the way it is treated. And this is a point that I bring up over and over again because I don't think how they can escape uh, the conclusion that if they believe the Blessed Sacrament is truly consecrated in these churches, then particles of the host are strewn on the floor and they're walking on them. And it's a contradiction for them to go there, pres presumably to honor our Lord, but knowing for a fact that they are walking over particles of the host, which they worship. Uh, it's, it's impossible. I, I feel very sad for the, for the woman because I know she must be going through the pains of purgatory to resolve this, but nonetheless, the best thing for her is to stay at home and practice her Catholic faith in her home as well as she can. That's what the Catholics would have done in missionary times when there was no priest. Right. And to try to get to the true mass whenever it is mm -hmm. possible. Even in missionary times in this country, I can uh, remember where in the 1700s, it might be only once a year when the faithful got to go to Mass, and in fact, they married themselves in front of witnesses until a priest could come, or without a priest. Which is provided for by Canon Law, Canon right. 1098. I would encourage her, though, to stay in contact, though, and let us know. And, and not only uh, to keep in contact yourself, but to let a close friend uh, at, uh, at, well, let us know if there's anything that happens to her, like an automobile accident or a, a catastrophic illness, so that we can find out how she's doing, because uh, you know a traditional priest could conceivably go to see her, especially if she were in danger, mm -hmm. if she were in the hospital. And that is one of the things we do. Uh, we have uh, uh, many responsibilities, but of course, uh, what we all believe is number one is to assist the dying and those people who need the sacraments. And our priests travel very far, sometimes. Uh, 2,000 miles to administer the last rites to someone. I'd even like to mention another thing which Father Jenkins has initiated and which is in fact drawing much, uh, producing much fruit. Periodically there are women who are being pressured into having an abortion against their wills and uh, they might call us to ask for help and we'd certainly like to encourage them to do so because we have helped people in this situation. Increasingly there are other people who have uh, been brought into severe distress by contact with Satanists and such. Right. And again, we are there to help. If you need a priest, if you need someone to help, please call us. We'll do what we can. We've done it in the past, and we'd consider a privilege to be able to do so again. Reverend Fathers, what is being taught in the seminaries? You both went to uh, the so-called official seminaries, even in the late 60s, early 70s, before you went to Econ in Switzerland. What was being taught then? What's being taught now? How, how are these new priests being formed? When I was in a seminary, I went uh, first in 1964, and I entered a Franciscan seminary in Pennsylvania. I had two years there, the two years of liberal arts, and then I went into the novitiate of that Franciscan seminary and then studied philosophy at Catholic University, and I finished there, I graduated in 1969, and entered uh, the seminary on Long Island. And that is where I really got the exposure to this modernist doctrine. It was a rather conservative seminary, but there was no question whatsoever, but what they taught there was radically 
irreconcilable with the Catholic faith. Such things as, for example, that Joseph may have been the natural father of Christ, there's no objective moral law, that uh, the, the uh, account we have in sacred scripture of the birth of our Lord, the infancy, the coming of the Magi, the shepherds, that that was just a myth that was basically made up to fill in the gaps. That, that's what I was taught, and that's why I say, you know, some people say, well, Father, you know, some of the things you say seem pretty strong, uh, but I, I can only tell you, I was there, I went through it, I listened to these people in the class, I got into an argument one day with a professor of dogmatic theology. Dogma is the most important uh, series of courses that you take. Uh, with a fiery argument, because I was trying to convince this priest teaching in a seminary that Christ died for our sins. <laughs> he was insisting, insisting that Christ did not die an atoning death for our sins. That's what I was taught. That's amazing. Yeah. Brother Jenkins, uh, you, we often hear the argument, well, in Europe things are normal, it's just this American church wants to break away, they're disobedient. You attended for a while the Angelican, the Pontifical University in Rome. <coughs> what was your experience there? My experience there was not a very pleasant one. Um, uh, I had I'd gone to the Angelicum uh, after attending for uh, three semesters at the University of Innsbruck, which is Jesuit run. And uh, we were told some pretty outrageous things there. In fact, the year uh, after I left there, uh, one of the scripture professors actually did leave the priesthood. He simply disappeared with uh, one of the women he met in, in, in Innsbruck. And, uh, but this, I, I'd gotten somewhat accustomed to hearing of things like this, so it didn't shock me too much, it just saddened me. But, you know, after going through Innsbruck, which was quite radical, uh, I figured that the Angelicum, which is actually a pontifical university directly under John Paul II himself, uh, would be very conservative, because I'd heard all kinds of things about how conservative he was and so on. And uh, I found out that that was not the case at all. It's, it's under Paul VI, and now it's under John Paul II, because it is a pontifical university. There were things that were being taught there uh, that were absolutely blasphemous. Uh, our New Testament professor, for example, read the passage of our Lord healing the paralytic who had been let down through the roof. Um, and uh, the professor simply dismissed it. He said, this never happened. Period. Never happened. No such thing. He said this was an invention of the early church. He said the spirit guided the early church to invent this story for one purpose, and that was to justify their claim to be able to forgive sins. So it was a complete fabrication. But he was saying that Christ never intended this, was never even aware of it, he said, that such a story would take place or would be invented. But it was the result of the spirit guiding the early faith community. So I, I interjected at this point, raising my hand uh, and saying to him, Father, uh, how is it possible that the third person of the Blessed Trinity uh, could do something that the second person of the Blessed Trinity had no notion of and wouldn't even agree with? <laughs> and he said, well, I'm not going to get into the question of the consciousness of Jesus. And so I, I responded, well, it seems to me that you already have. And he repeated that, I'm not going to get into the con consciousness of Jesus, and then completely brushed me off. And uh, this, this I mentioned, not because this was unusual, but just that it was the icing on the cake. Because I stood outside the classroom afterwards, and we had 40 to 50 of the most conservative seminarians from all over the country in that classroom, because it was reputed from all over the world, I'm sorry, yes. Many Americans, but not exclusively Americans. And these were the ones who were destined to become the Monsignors and the bishops in the future, having studied in Rome at a pontifical university. And I asked them if they saw anything wrong with what he said. They didn't. They didn't see anything wrong with that. And I thought, what are they going to be teaching from the pulpits five, six years from now? This is what Father Owlsworth teaches in, in Cleveland, that, mm -hmm. you know, the devil's a myth and so on. But nothing has changed, though. Right, nothing that essential myth, has that's changed. That's the myth. Right, that's what they say. <laughs> if you want a myth, that's a myth. Nothing has no. changed, and if you, you still insist that something has changed, it can't have changed because the authority says it didn't. 
<laughs> you know, I must think obey. The, the, the icing on the cake from our point of view, I think, is our Lord's injunction or command that, uh, or rather advice, by their fruits he shall know them. Mm -hmm. Since this new religion, annulments have increased 15,000% in the 18,000 percent. 18,000 From 68 to 88. How can nothing essentially have changed? How many Catholics now call themselves Catholics and uh, follow the teacher, church's teaching on artificial contraception, maybe 5%? Well, you, you know the story of the emperor's new clothes, don't mm -hmm. you? Uh, sure. These uh, <clears throat> weavers showed up one time in the kingdom of this emperor who loved new clothes, who mm -hmm. constantly changed his clothes. If anybody was looking for, for matters of state, they could find him in the tailor's uh, trying on some new clothes. Mm -hmm. And these two weavers came along and said, we have this new cloth, which is the most wondrous uh, cloth that has ever been uh, created. Uh, it is so wondrous that only people of special character are able to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, they pulled out this, this big bolt of nothing. supposedly cloth and there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. And they said, only a fool cannot see this cloth. And so the emperor said, I don't want to admit that I'm a fool. He pretended that it was really cloth. And he had this big suit, this new clothes made out of it. And of course, the people around him uh, went along with it. And so some little girl said, the emperor has no clothes. Right. You've been watching what Catholics believe. I'd like to.